welcome back and uh, now we are about to start the much look forward to guest lecture by uh, sir michael mahmud first let me uh, introduce sir michael mahmud uh, this is basically just a preliminary because i don't think sir michael mahmud needs any introduction to any audience in the health sector uh, this uh, just as by tradition professor sir michael mahmud is a director of international institute of society and health mrc research professor of epidemiology and public health university college london michael mahmud has led a research group on health inequalities for the past 30 years he is a principal investigator of the white hole studies of british civil servants investigating explanations for the striking inverse social gradient in morbidity and mortality he leads the english longitudinal study of aging elsa and is engaged in several international research efforts on social determinants of health he chairs the department of health scientific reference group on tackling health inequalities in 2000 he was knighted by her majesty the queen for services to epidemiology and understanding health inequalities sir michael is not an, not a stranger to sri lanka he has visited sri lanka many times and has been a uh, chief guest of sri lanka medical association annual conference uh, for many times at, at least twice so he'll be talking to us about role of social determinants of health in the new normal which is a very important and relevant topic in the current situation or to sir michael thank you and it's a pleasure in a sense to be here although <laughs> not quite here virtually you can you confirm you can see my slides uh, we uh, we can hear you clearly sir michael uh, if you can uh, start your slide sharing can you i i just put it up can you see them uh, we can see the slides yes now it's fine it's fine it's coming great perfect okay, now thank you i have been much concerned with social determinants of health and health equity and then of course the covid pandemic crashed upon us. I want to put what I'm doing in a global perspective, but then if you'll forgive me, I'm going to talk about the UK because we've been doing a lot of work over the last 12 months in the UK. So to start globally, <clears throat> I chaired the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, and that led to a series of commissions. And I chaired the Commission of the American region of WHO, Pan PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization. We had the Commission of PAHO of Equity and Health and Inequalities in the Americas, and we published our report last year. We began with a quote from Nelson Mandela, overcoming poverty is not a gesture of charity, it's an act of justice, it's the protection of fundamental human rights, the right to dignity and a decent life. And the conceptual framework of the PAHO report built on the conceptual framework of the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health. And each of these elements, we had recommendations. So we had three structural drivers with recommendations addressing them political, social, cultural, and economic structures, natural environment, land, and climate change, and colonialism and structural racism. And then seven conditions of daily life, early life and education, working life, older people, income and social protection, violence, environment and housing, and health systems. And then two, related to taking action, the quality of governance and human rights. And we took an approach of intersectionality, looking at social and economic inequities, gender, sexuality, ethnicity. We did a lot on indigenous versus non-indigenous people, ethnic minorities, disability and migration. And the outcome, was health equity and a dignified life. Address the social determinants of health and you will improve 
the likelihood of people leading lives of dignity as well as increasing health equity. So that was the framework we were operating on last year. And then of course came COVID. The United Nations Development Program, UNDP, produces a human development report each year. And they produced a special one this year because of COVID-19. This is the global burden of disease, daily deaths, and stylized transport injuries, HIV AIDS, self-harm, malaria, and there's COVID-19. These are global figures, absolutely dramatic. The Human Development Report uses a Human Development Index, which has three components, life expectancy, education, and gross national income per person adjusted for purchasing power. And this is the Global Human Development Index. And you can see it was improving globally every year, some years a bit more rapidly, some years a bit slower, but improving every year, there was the global financial crisis. It improved a little more slowly after that, but still improving. And then 220, 2020, the effect of COVID-19, absolutely dramatic effect globally on the Human Development Index. Let me switch tack for a moment. Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico in 2017. Two months later, this was the rise of deaths in the lowest socioeconomic group, the medium socioeconomic group, and the highest. A huge external shock, like a hurricane, exposes the inequalities in society and amplifies them. And so it is with COVID-19. It exposes the underlying inequalities in society and amplifies them. The opening lines of my book, The Health Gap, were why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick. Doctors, of course, are concerned with the healthcare system and in, at the time of the pandemic, it's vital, of course it is, but I want to talk about the conditions that make people sick. I reminded you that I chaired the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, and we reported in 2008. And the British government, Prime Minister Gordon Brown, asked, could we apply the findings and recommendations of the Global Commission to one country, England? So I conducted a new review, which became known as the Marmot Review, in England, and we published that in 2010, Fair Society, Healthy Lives. And in February 2020, we published a report, Health Equity in England, the Marmot Review 10 years on. We looked back, what had happened? I published a report saying what you needed to do to improve health and reduce health inequalities. What happened? in the last 10 years. A quick summary, we've lost a decade and it shows. This is life expectancy at birth from 1980. It was improving about one year every four years for women and for men. And then 2010, 11, the curve changes and the increase slows dramatically. What happened in 2010? Well, we got a new government, a conservative-led coalition government. The government was a bit sensitive. You're not saying, are you, that it's anything we did that was responsible for this? Well, could be. We need to look at that question. One comment that was made was, well, the improvement in life expectancy 
has got to slow down sometime. It can't go on increasing forever. So we looked at other rich countries, at their improvement between 2011 and 2017. Estonia, Norway, Slovakia, Hungary, Denmark, Belgium, Austria, Japan, Czech, all of these countries had a more rapid improvement in life expectancy than did the UK. The only countries that had slower improvement were Iceland and the United States. So no, we had not reached peak life expectancy. We were doing worse than almost every other rich country except the United States and Iceland. And then came COVID-19. One way of comparing countries internationally is to look at excess mortality because of the difficulty of assigning cause of death. So the excess mortality is calculated by looking at how many deaths would you predict for each week of 2020 based on the mortality rates of the previous five years, how many deaths were observed, and the difference between the observed and the expected is the excess. So this is excess deaths per 100,000 people, higher in England than in Scotland, and higher in England than any other country. Anyone who's looked at the US will say the US managed the pandemic catastrophically badly. And in England, we did worse. So I asked the question, could our poor health record over the last decade that I reported on in February 2020 link to our poor management of the pandemic? And yeah, I think the two could be related. And one way they could be related is the nature of inequalities. This is deprivation of area by decile, the most deprived, the least deprived. People in the most deprived decile have shorter life expectancy than everybody else, but it's, inequalities are not confined to poor health for the poor. It's a social gradient. The less the deprivation, the longer the life expectancy, all the way from top to bottom, for men and for women. The gap between the least deprived and the most deprived is 9.5 years for men, 7.7 .7 years for women, and that gap has been increasing. The gradient has been getting steeper over the last 10 years. And if we look at regions within England, really quite interesting. This is women, look at, the least deprived 10%. It doesn't much matter where in the country you live if you're in the least deprived 10%. And wherever you live, life expectancy was going up a bit. For the most deprived 10%, the regional differences are much bigger. Life expectancy for the bottom decile was going up in London, but getting worse everywhere else. So just to summarize, before the pandemic struck in England, we had a slowdown in the improvement in life expectancy, increasing inequalities between social groups and regions, and health was getting worse for people in the most deprived areas outside London. So we came into the pandemic in a parlous state. And then when we look at COVID-19 mortality by deprivation, the gray is all deaths, so all causes, shows the gradient I just showed you. And the blue is COVID-19, a very similar gradient. It means the causes of inequalities in COVID-19 are very similar to the causes of inequalities in health more generally. This excess in the bottom three deciles, we think is related to employment in frontline occupations, occupational exposure to the virus, and living in multi-generational overcrowded households. 
Scotland, rather similar. There's the social gradient for all causes, and there's the social gradient for COVID-19. And I just saw these data from Toronto. The share of COVID-19 cases and the share of the Toronto population um, by income of the area, by household income. And you can see the lower the household income, the higher the COVID-19, a similar kind of gradient. We looked also at ethnic differences. Females, people classified as black British, this is in England. You can see astonishingly high mortality from COVID-19 in black British, and then adjusting for deprivation and other socioeconomic measures, that accounts for more than two thirds of the excess. Bangladeshi and Pakistani, almost all the excess can be linked to deprivation. When we look at men, you see something similar. It's not all accounted for by deprivation, but much of it is Bangladeshi, Pakistani, there's Indian. So a big excess. I was asked on the BBC what I thought about this. Our health minister had said he was very concerned about the ethnic differences and that people should wash their hands and practice social distancing. And I was asked, what did I think? I said, that's good advice. And we should deal with structural racism. Yeah, but what should we do tomorrow? Tomorrow, we should deal with structural racism. And subsequent analyses from our Office for National Statistics looked at adjusting for age, for geography, deprivation, density, socioeconomic measures, and prior health status. Interesting for, for the Black African and Black Caribbean, uh, adjusting for prior ill health doesn't seem to explain much of the excess. Although in Bangladeshi and Pakistani and Indian, some of the excess, some can be accounted for by prior ill health. One of the rumors that's doing the rounds is that if you take the action to control the pandemic, shut down the economy, the cure is worse than the disease. So we can't afford the economic hit. Actually, that's quite incorrect. JP Morgan forecasts for 2020 GD GDP growth, China, Taiwan, South Korea, all control the pandemic very well and will have relatively small economic hit. The UK, which controlled it very badly, will have a huge economic hit, as will Mexico. And looking at cumulative deaths per million from the outbreak and fall in GDP, the higher the deaths per million, the bigger the economic hit. So Finland, Japan, Indonesia, China, Vietnam, that controlled the pandemic well, had a smaller hit to their economy. When I've been asked, well, what lessons can we learn? This is from the Financial Times, by the way. What lessons can we learn? My answer is look east, look east. Um, ask, what did Vietnam, China, South Korea, uh, Japan do and New Zealand uh, to control the pandemic. So given that I said that inequalities in COVID-19 mortality are rather similar to inequalities in health more generally, the social gradient, it means that the recommendations that I made back in 2010 to tackle health inequalities in England are relevant. We had six domains of recommendations give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, 
fair employment and good work for all. Number four, really radical. Everyone should have at least the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. Number five, healthy and sustainable places and communities in which to live and work. And the sixth, taking a social determinants approach to prevention. So what happened after 2010? Well, the first thing is the government said they wanted to roll back the state. They didn't quite say that. They said austerity. We need to cut public expenditure. And by golly, they did it. In 2009-10, 42% of GDP was public sector expenditure. And that dropped year on year. So by 2018-19, that 42% had become 35%. We were in the middle of the European range in 2009-10, and we were towards the bottom of the European range at the end of the decade. They rolled back the state. And they did it in a most regressive way. This is spending per person by local government by level of deprivation of the area. So the gray is total local authority spending. In the least deprived 20% of areas, local authority spending went down by around 16%. And then the more deprived the area, the greater the reduction. In the most deprived areas, the reduction was 32%. This is remarkable. The greater the deprivation, the greater the need. The greater the need, the greater the reduction in spending. Remarkably regressive. Could this have played a role in worsening health inequalities? Yeah, I think it could. And we limped into the pandemic with our public services in a very poor state because of these regressive cuts in expenditure. These policies of austerity were pursued in the name of economic growth. The government said, we'll become like Greece unless we make these cuts. So they made cuts and we did become like Greece because there was negative wage growth. Here in the UK between 2007 and 2018, the only countries that did worse than us were Greece and Mexico. UK, Portugal, all of these other countries had positive wage growth. We had sh sharp, strict austerity pursued in a regressive way, and we didn't even get the wage growth that they promised us. They said, that's why we're doing it. I'm not gonna go through all six domains, but just to give you an example, children living in poverty. We know if children live in poverty, it damages early child development, damages their health. They do less well in school. If they do less well in school, they're less likely to get a good job, high income, live in a nice place. And health inequalities in adult life start early in life. Poverty is defined as living in a household at less than 60% median income. Before housing costs, it's about 18% of children were in poverty in 2010, 11. After housing costs, because housing is so expensive, it's about 27% living in poverty. And that 27% went up to 30%. Child poverty went up. If we look at household type, here the green is lone parent not working. In 2010, 61% of children were in poverty, the lone parent not working, and that went up to 70% by 2017-18. Work was supposed to be the way out of poverty. So if we look at a lone parent in full-time work, 18% were in poverty in 2010-11, and that went up to 30% by 2017-18. So 
for families with children, poverty was going up. And if we look at the changes that the Minister of Finance made, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, to the tax and benefit system by family type, the green here is working age families with children. If your family was in the bottom 10% of household income, as a result of changes to the tax and benefit system, predictably your income would go down by 15%. Look at the second bottom de decile, your income would go down by 12%. The third by about 9%. And then the richer you were, the less the reduction in income. The Minister of Finance, it would appear, had an explicit policy to make poor people poorer. And then we come to the pandemic and lockdown. This is food insecurity pre COVID 19 and during the pandemic food insecurity went up dramatically. We're talking about the UK, a very rich country. Two million children were food insecure. They're the ones who were not, but huge during the pandemic. And then lockdown and learning. Teachers were surveyed because the schools closed in the first lockdown. And teachers in the least deprived schools, schools in the least deprived areas, said 3% of their children were not behind at all. 24% were one month behind, 32% were two months behind. Teachers in the most deprived schools said 11% of their children were six months or more behind. 18% were five months behind, 24% were four months behind. So you can see the educational divide increased with the closure of schools. Come back to the global picture presented by the UNDP. They classify countries into low, medium, high, and very high human development. And this is the effective out of school rate for primary school age children. Pre pandemic in the low human development countries, just under 27% of primary school age children were effectively out of school. And that went up to 86% during the pandemic. Medium development countries, just under 7%, 74%. So you can see lockdown had a big effect on being out of school, much bigger the lower the human development. So looking globally, this is the percent of primary school age children who were out of school in 1970, about 27-28%. And that came down very pleasingly. Wow under 10%. In other words, by 2019, more than 90% of primary school age children globally were in school. Now the blue dot is the effect of lockdown. Being out of school rises dramatically. The red dot is what would have been predicted had there been no internet access, much higher out of school rate. And the black dot is a scenario if you could close the internet gap within a human development group. So in other words, it's not saying that within the low development group, every child should have the same access as in Finland. It's saying that every child should have the same access as the best of within their group. You could, with this relatively simple technology, internet access, you could abolish almost completely the effective out of school rate. This is, I'm putting in air quotes, a simple intervention. And then of course, people in low income groups are much more vulnerable during the COVID-19 crisis because they lack the ability to come up with emergency funds by wealth quintile the ability to come up with emergency funds. Now, of course, if you're in the top 
wealth quintile, you've got much greater ability to come up with emergency funds, but you're less likely to need it because it's people towards the bottom who lost their jobs, um, whose employment closed. And even in very high in, uh, human development countries, people in the bottom wealth quintile, fewer than half, less than half, could come up with emergency funds. Let me show you something that's a bit speculative. I came across this about six weeks ago, the Social Progress Index, and they have about 16 different measures, but I chose two. Include One is inclusiveness. And I compared three countries, Germany, that has handled the pandemic very well, the US, which has handled the pandemic very badly, and Brazil, that has also handled it very badly. So on inclusiveness, the US ranked only just below Germany, but the difference opened up. The US declined pretty rapidly after 2016, so the difference was much bigger, and Brazil more dramatic still. Another of the indices, personal safety. There's Germany, high and remaining high. There's the US. Wow. It seems to have taken a dramatic drop, probably around the 20th of January, 2017. You can guess what happened then. And Brazil was always much lower. Now, this is not even correlation. It's speculation. I'm speculating that countries that handled the pandemic well were countries that do well on the social progress index. They're well-functioning societies. Countries that were not such well-functioning societies did much less well. At the beginning, it was said that COVID-19 was the great leveler. Look at these figures from the USA, what the great leveler did. From March to September, America's 643 billionaires increased their wealth by 29%, $845 billion. That wasn't all Jeff Bezos and Amazon, but a lot of it was. Hourly wages of the bottom 82% of the workforce declined by 4.4% at the same time. How is that compatible with building a fair society with good health for all? The answer is it's not. I don't want to leave this without thinking about the environment. PM10 concentrations, of air pollution, higher in more deprived areas than less deprived in all of these English cities. And in our 2020 report, we tried to bring climate change and health equity together. We said, for example, 100% of new housing should be carbon neutral by 2030. And we should aim for net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, ensuring inequalities do not widen as a result. On the 15th of December, we will publish Build Back Fairer, the COVID-19 Marmot Review. There's a lot of talk about Build Back Better. What I've just shown you is that before the pandemic hit the UK, the status quo was not desirable. Stalling life expectancy, increased inequalities in health, falling life expectancy for the poorest people. We don't want normal life to return. Normal wasn't very good. We want to build back fairer. So the report that we will publish next Tuesday will look at the impact of the pandemic and the containment of the pandemic, revisit my recommendations from February this year, and we hope give the building blocks to building back fair. And I hope, although the report is about England, that people in other countries will find it useful. Let me finish with this. 
A well-being approach can be described as enabling people to have the capabilities they need to live lives of purpose, balance and meaning for them. Where might I have got that quote? Amartya Sen, Jewel of India, Nobel Prize winning economist and philosopher, perhaps, but no, I got it from the New Zealand Treasury in 2019. As we think about building back fairer after the pandemic, I would like to think we could put at the heart of government policy a well being approach, which can be described as enabling people to have the capabilities they need to live lives of purpose, balance, and meaning for them. So, thank you. Professor Michael Mahmoud, thank you. Thank you for showing us that pandemics doesn't affect everyone equally. Thank you for showing us that disparities exist universally, regardless of whether it is East or West. And thank you for telling us, if we don't focus on this reality, we'll be looking down on a vicious cycle that might end up in human tragedy. Thank you very much. These were the thoughts that were echoing right throughout the conference. So, APEC 2020 has saved the best for the last. And I cannot think of a more fitting finale for this conference. Again, I would like to thank Professor Michael Mahmoud on behalf of Sri Lanka Medical Association and Asia Pacific Academic Consortium for Public Health. Thank you very much.